So now we have our keynote, um, but rather than have keynote speech, we have keynote um, recast as a conversation. Um, so we're very lucky to have Janet Mock here, who is a writer, cultural commentator, advocate for trans rights, among other things. Also, um, I guess I should say that my first introduction to Janet was when she um, gave a uh, speech at my daughter's graduation in Pitzer last year. Oh, wow. And um, I was on the edge of my seat where I was actually very impressed with the whole concept of multiple intersections of narrative for how people define themselves. And I thought, this is the person we want for the keynote, oh. so that was, uh, <laughs> that was what convinced me. She's also, also the author of the autobiographical work, Redefining Realness, um, which my daughter gave me for a Christmas present. And, and I, I read Hanging on Every Word, and since this conference was about language and gender, I was also noting that uh, she has this exquisite ear and ability to put into words um, different forms of language. Um, so I guess we'll get into her background, but I just noted, for example, the way she was able to capture a kind of a, a, a matriarchal African-American dialect in Dallas, but also kind of a trans language that one finds in Hawaii. And it was just an amazing journey for me to, to read this. So I'm just saying I have all these kind of markings and underlines in the book um, for that. And interviewing um, Janet is Moya Bailey, who's a Dean's Fellow of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Northeastern. Um, and we'll be interviewing Janet as a kind of fireside chat. <laughs> and also uses her book in, uh, as one of the texts in uh, her Gender Studies class. Uh, I had the great privilege of having a chance to chat with Moya about this um, conference. And, I'll just turn it over to Moya, and I think it's going to be a great session. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and being here. I'm, I know. Thank I, you. I'm really excited to talk Me to too. you. Me too. So I wanted to start with the book because I, too, fell in love with the book after reading it. I read it in one sitting, and I was like, I know I need to assign this to my women's studies students because the way that you talk about language and such, and language and gender and sexuality and race mm -hmm. in really, really nuanced ways, but also in an accessible way. I love that and my students do too. Thank I'm, you for that. You're welcome. Um, so Redefining Realness invokes the language of queer and trans communities and you write that realness is the ability to be seen as heteronormative, to assimilate, to not be read as other or deviate from the norm. Realness means you are extraordinary in your embodiment of what society deems normative. To embody realness rather than performing or competing realness enables trans women to enter spaces with a lower risk of being rebutted or questioned, policed or attacked. Realness is a pathway to survival. I just thought that was a wonderful quote and giving people the opportunity to take a look at that. How does your work continue to redefine realness for mm -hmm. yourself and for others? What's so interesting is the first time I ever heard the term realness was in Paris is burning. And I remember watching it with girlfriends when we were teenagers um, and just kind of getting our entire life from it because we had never seen parts of ourselves reflected in like a mainstream product in that kind of way, right? Like supposedly everyone saw this when it came out mm -hmm. and we couldn't believe that these women existed in another space beyond our own, mm -hmm. that they were being recorded and archived and you know, their living history was there and it existed and we know how powerful that is. Um, and I remember when Dorian Corey, who's kind of like the matriarch, or there's a lot of matriarchs, right? <laughs> a lot of mothers of houses in that film, um, seeing her break down the, not just the definition of realness, which I kind of share there, which is mostly linked to being able to pass in a dominant um, cisgender and white and for New York, you know, New York City street kids, right. rich society, right? Being able to walk on Park Avenue and not have anyone clock you, as we would say. Um, so it was linked with passing so, so strongly. 
But for me, I think the way that I've tried to redefine realness is to take it away from this just this idea of being able to blend in as cisgender, as non-trans, and um, to kind of say like what is authentic and real to us, because I think that so often for trans folk, we're constantly, and I think even see this now in a lot of movement spaces, we're constantly trying to just create space to talk about, just call me my name, call me my pronouns, yes. right? And let me just, just respect that. And so a lot of our arguments are around language. And I've, as someone in media, I expect to argue around language oftentimes because I'm dealing with you know, I'm dealing as a public facing person, mm -hmm. talking about, talking on behalf, right, of an entire community of people that are completely diverse. Yeah. Um, and so for me, realness is about kind of taking it more internal, mm -hmm. right, what is real to me, and that's truth, and that's fact. Um, and no one gets to tell you what real is for you, what is authentic. Um, and no one gets to then, doesn't get to delegitimize your truth. And so that's what the journey of writing that book has often been about. And that's kind of what my work is constantly battling with at times, because I find myself in conversations where, you know, I remember going on the Colbert Report, and he couldn't, like, his mind around, like, the idea that there's more than he, she, and her, hers, and um, just was, you know, mind-boggling and so like to have to do that in mainstream spaces to folk who are not initiated in our conversations around gender is kind of the multi-layered part of some of that work and i'm so grateful for your text as being a place where you can send people now mm -hmm. so that you don't have to do that education work and talk well, to yeah, people yeah that gets me in trouble too sometimes <laughs> i'm like i don't do one-on-one -on -one, i'm sorry i've read done that already <laughs> read the book read the book <laughs> But related to that, I mean, realness also makes me think about the way you talk about passing. And I wanted to mm. play a clip, if people can cue the clip where you're talking about what passing means and how it is being used in ways that don't actually talk about the realities of trans lives. I am a woman. I live my life as a woman. And that's how I should be perceived. I'm not passing as anything. I'm being, being myself. I have such um, a complicated relationship with the concept of passing, period. Not even applying it to my own life, but just the idea that to pass means that you're passing is something that you're not, right? Passing comes off as if you're, you are actively, right, because it's a verb, you're actively engaging in, in some kind of trickery or deception. And so that's where I get irritated with passing because anytime that I walk on the street, my gender is visible. I am a woman. People see me and take me as a woman. And that is not passing. That's me just being. But once I disclose that I am trans, things change. And then I become an oddity. I become an object, something that is objectified and gawked over. And my humanity and womanhood is then checked and um, put into question. So I can just imagine someone who does not have the conditional privilege of passing, having to have to deal with that all the time. So those are the, the layered relationships with the lived experiences of being a woman that is often seen as cis. I hate watching videos of myself. It's like so, <laughs> yeah, it's so like bizarre. And so the book hadn't come out yet and me and my my boyfriend at the time, Aaron, who's now my husband, we were, he was like, we should probably do some little like video things of you just to like introduce what the, some of the um, themes of the book are. And I remember we did that and then he did that dress thing and I was like, that was me primping. Like, that wasn't <laughs> supposed to be captured, but I just dedicated myself to realness. I just let it <laughs> be a part of the conversation. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, I think that is what people love about you and what you bring to the conversation. and. Taking that conversation a little further, I want to just read uh, a bit of your quote about passing from the text. And you say, these thoughts surrounding identity, gender, bodies, and how we view, judge, and objectify all women brings me to the subject of passing, a term based on an assumption that trans people are passing as something they are not. 
It's rooted in the idea that we are not really who we say we are, that we are holding a secret, that we are living false lives. Examples of people passing in media, whether through race, imitation of life, and Nella Larson's passing, etc., are often portrayed, oh, in class and gender, are often portrayed as leading a life of tragic duplicity and as deceivers who will be punished harshly by society when their truths are, truth, true identity is under, uncovered. This is, not, this is no different for trans people who pass as their gender or more accurately are assumed to be cis or blend in as cis as if that is the standard or the norm. This pervasive thinking frames trans people as illegitimate and unnatural. If a trans woman who knows herself operates in the world and is seen as a woman, perceived, treated, and viewed as a woman, isn't she just being herself? She isn't passing, she is merely being. And I love that piece of it because I think you're calling out the ways that we make assumptions about gender as cis people and our expectations of what we imagine difference and other to be. Mm -hmm. And so do you see more people challenging this concept of passing now that you've talked about it, now that people have access to the book? I hope so. I don't, I don't know if I've seen that, but I don't think it's only cis people who make assumptions around folks' as gender and pronouns and identities, right? Like, I make assumptions all the time. I remember the other night there's a, um, a non-binary um, professor who was in this space at another talk that I was giving. And I just assumed because I saw lipstick and curly hair and kind of a non-conforming experience of femininity that I was like, oh, so maybe I'll be complimenting her by saying she and her. And then I was like, wait, are your pronouns she and her? And then they said, no, it's not. It's they, them, theirs. That's what I would prefer. And then I apologize for making these assumptions, right? So even though I'm talking about this, <laughs> these topics and the way that we need to break this down and stop assuming, I still make assumptions on a daily basis. And we all kind of do it, right? Um, and so for me, the idea of, I hope that people are challenging that and continuing to interrogate <laughs> and maybe stop a bit of their inclinations or instincts to just completely like assume immediately. Um, I never liked passing because it always felt as if, if I am passing, then is someone else failing, mm -hmm. right? And so I feel as if uh, I did nothing to have to present the way that I do, right? To, to have the things that I have that enable me access to quote unquote pass this test, and folks may not have that, and so it's like one of those, and so the conditional privilege of being able to blend in. And so I would prefer us not to talk about passing too much, but I understand that it is a privilege that I do have, right? The fact that I, not only do I pass as a cisgender woman, but I am also fall into the line of what we consider to be a, an attractive woman, right? Because we also have to unpack that, because some people be like, well, the fact that you're pretty, doesn't that help you? And it's like, well, yeah, pretty privilege is real, right? And passing privilege is real, but they're not one in the same. Right. Right, like you can have both, exactly. right? They can stack up. You can be a trans person that it does not pass, does not blend in, but is gorgeous, right? Like Laverne Cox would tell me in conversations all the time, she's like, I know that I'm a beautiful woman, right? But I don't pass, mm. right? I don't blend in as cisgender. And so right. like even all of that stuff and trying to unpack those layers of like, all of that. But I don't want to like completely just throw out passing because I also understand that it's a part of systems and the way in which people make often make assumptions about me based on the way that I present and how I am passing all of these tests. And then it enables me access into spaces to be seen and heard on the levels that I'm seen and heard. And I think that piece, I mean, one of the things that hasn't happened so much yet in the conversation is looking at the intersections of both the ways that gender and race and class come together. So what I love about your definition is that you also think about class as a form of passing. Mm. I mean, you give the example, example of Joe Millionaire and mm. some of these shows where people are also quote unquote passing as being in a different class category. And I wonder if you maybe wanted to talk about that, like how does intersectionality show up in your life? Oh my God, how does it show up in my life? <laughs> um, well, I think about even the way that I speak, right? I think I, I may have talked about it a little bit in terms of 
in the book about this idea of you know my mother telling me I couldn't speak Hawaiian pidgin, the way in which my all of my friends and my older siblings and my grandmother spoke, right? We were always around her. My mom was like, you're not gonna speak in pidgin. You're gonna speak proper English. And so being able to speak proper English, when I went to the mainland, most times I wasn't marked as being from Hawaii or having some kind of, something that denoted, because also pidgin denoted class too, right? Like the fact that I didn't come, like I could speak some of the buzz terms in academia, I could speak some of the buzz terms in feminism and transness and all of these things that then enabled me to kind of be accepted as, okay, so you're passing this test of, so we all come from the same space. Like, no, but we don't come from the same space, right? Like, I come from, like, the streets of Oakland and Dallas and Hawaii, and I have all these things, but I've shedded. I've learned to shed all these things in order to then now fit into this very class moneyed space. Like, for example, for me, for NYU or People Magazine or whatever the spaces that I go into, or in, as a TV presenter, right, or a TV host, I speak in a way that people are comfortable hearing, Right, wow. and it doesn't necessarily represent where all of I come from. And do right? you think you shed those things, or do you think that you like make decisions about when you deploy them? I think because it was so much a part of my survival, it's become part of just the way that I present and I am. But when yeah. I'm around family, it's different, right? Yeah. Like so, in different spaces, you you show up. So oftentimes, not as a different person, but you present and are, you feel comfortable enough to show that, right? Yes. So in intimate space, the intimate space of family, I can speak Hawaiian pidgin and I feel comfortable doing that because no one will judge me. They understand that that is an entry in, that is how we speak, that is for us. Yes. And, and that's what language is, right? Yeah, and that's that leads me to another question that I was gonna ask later, but how is it, how do you decide what language is appropriate for what spaces. You know, mm. as black people, we talk a lot about code switching and making mm. decisions about what we say and when we don't say it. Do you think that there's some gendered language that is specifically for communities that shouldn't be shared mm. and shouldn't go further? Because I know mm. you made a decision, or I remember watching a video where you were making a decision about the title mm. and that there was maybe a moment where you're gonna call it Go Fish. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Fish food. Fish food. Yes, and so making a decision not mm. to, not to use that term was that also about who you wanted to have access to that language? I think so, um, but going back to the intersectionality really yes. quick. Yes. So like even like the idea of passing, right? So yes, I can pass and blend in as a cisgender woman in the world, right? But also the layer of race comes in. So I'm passing as, and that offers me um, to pass as a, to be able to blend in as a cis woman enables me a level of safety that tra other trans women who are not able to blend in as easily as I do don't have, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then the next layer of that is I'm also passed. So if, that, if that's a test that I am passing there, I'm still perceived as a then cisgender black woman. I don't know how safe cisgender black women are in the world, right? And so like these are things where it's like a lot of people will, even within trans spaces, right? They'll be like, oh, well, she's, she, well, she's pretty and she passes, so no wonder she's, she's okay. Like, right. she's already hit. And it's like, no, we cannot then separate my transness from my blackness, right? Like, that's all a part of who I am. And just because you may have an agenda of what you believe is the hierarchical nature of quote unquote oppression Olympics doesn't mean that you can then negate the fact that I am a, still a black trans woman, right, in the world, right? Um, so going back to the talking about like, when do I make, you said, I think your question was, when do I make the decision? To, or so yeah. fish food, we'll just yeah. go with that. Yeah. So my friend Wendy, and who's a huge character in the book and also just a huge presence in my life still to this day, was like, you just call your, your book fish food. Like, cause you know, and fish is like equating it within, um, I think trans circles, ballroom circles, um, queer spaces. Well, I think like, you know, mostly trans girl spaces though, right? Like you're like, oh, she's serving fish today. Right, and meaning like, oh, catch of the day, you're fresh, you're like everything. Um, and we've seen that go outside of that space and be seen as something completely different, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's seen as misogynistic, it's seen as like a judgment of women's or some folk, people having vaginas, a judgment on vaginas, which then is a judgment of women, which is seen as sexist and misogynistic. And so for me, as uh, I realized that the danger of just having this term go out, right? Because this mm -hmm. book exists in spaces I have no control over, right? Okay. Um, I no longer wanted that term, which came from my own first hearing it at like 13 years old, like, ooh, girl, you're serving fish. 
I didn't want that to then be a judgment call on all trans folks, specifically all trans women, specifically all trans poor women of color, right? Like what is, what are those dynamics? And so I chose realness because I felt it was something that someone could see and kind of maybe understand what it meant and then maybe then get some depth of knowledge in terms of speaking about that or getting what the book's themes are. That's brilliant. One of the, one of the words that came up a lot um, last night was um, someone said that the words of the comedian were perfect. And I think sometimes we really have perfect language that gets us to mm. the heart of the matter. And making Well, voices. I feel like they're imperfect, right? Because like even the idea of like, I remember when, and that's still one of the things that, you know, like there's certain groups of folk who are looking, right, to like find your flaws, find your imperfections and something that, like thinking about Fish food, for example, is one of those things that's pulled out from people like, well, you're not a feminist because you use this word fish to describe all women. It's like, no, this is a language. This is a term that came out of a very specific community mm -hmm. that didn't really have to. It was more we were trans women were trying to womanhood was our goal, mm -hmm. right, to be able to pass and blend was like, that was the goal at the time when I right. was 12 years old. Like that was the holy grail was to be able to be seen as the woman I knew myself to be. And it had no idea, most of us had never been with women. We wouldn't have known what, you know, but like the, the, that has become one of those things where it's like it consistently comes up where it's oh. like, well, she calls women fish. And it's like, no, we were calling ourselves fish and we were not seen as real women. So, and you don't see us as real women anyway. So it was unreal women calling each other <laughs> fish, right? Yeah. Calling each other an animal. Plus I'm a Pisces, so I am a fish. <laughs> Which I would love to talk about more. <laughs> but I do want to move on to a bit of these, uh, to a bit of your pop culture mm. side of yourself. So as a pop culture journalist and longtime Beyonce fan, what are your thoughts about the words and voices of Messi Maya and mm. Big Frida uh, and not their faces in the video formation? And so for those who don't know, Messi Maya and Big Frida are gender nonconforming uh, black people who have definitely a presence in New Orleans and have brought a lot of the cultural tradition of black queer and trans spaces to the mainstream? Well, I'm sad that they're not, like their faces and their images are not, I, I don't know if Messi Maya is still with us. Is she? Right, she's not. Yeah, um, but Big Frida is, right? Yeah. Like she's the center of her own reality show that I believe is like past season three now. So this is someone that I would have loved to see like get information, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like yeah. to really have someone's, not just their work in it, but then also to be, to have your work cited and to be seen, I think is, powerful, like it would have introduced millions of people to her, to her presence, to an uncomfortable, to an uncomfortable presence, yes. right? To really push, push the boundaries of what we say in this specific space, which I believe that Beyonce was doing with Formation was this unapologetic space of blackness. It would even challenge black folk to say that this is also a black person too. Yes. Right? Yes. Like someone that we're gonna also protect, someone that's also being harassed, not only by police and systems and all of the, the points of oppression, but also within her own people, within her own community, right? And so like that would have been something that I think would have trickled down to some trans girls being able to, you know, feel as if they've seen a part of themselves in, in this visual kind of unapologetic celebration of, of, of blackness. But on the other hand, I do love that Beyonce made such a political statement. For me, I've, you know, I've known Beyonce for 17 years now um, <laughs> through pop culture and television, specifically, <laughs> specifically through TRL. Uh, and I, have, I was always surprised that like, for some reason like white people were watching it and they were just like, like they were surprised that she was black or something. It was like, did you not see her in Tina Knowles originals? Like when she was 15 years old? Like did you not see her with a hot comb in her hand? Like did you not see the fact that she was like, you know, in a black girl group, like, yes. you know, and once in what you kind of realize after a while is that once someone becomes famous, you know, and they, they're, they're deemed as part of their um, famousness is that they can then quote unquote transcend race, right? And so the power to me about formation, um, about her releasing the video, about her then using all of America's like number one watched 
show, right, yeah. televised event, she was like, oh no, just so you guys remember, you know, my dad's from Alabama, my mother's from Louisiana, I'm a black girl, a southern black girl, right, which is a particular type of blackness, which I know that even you were talking yeah. about, just like her kind of being like, this is a southern blackness, like even that is complicated in its own thing, but even thinking about like folk who've then transcended blackness, right, OJ or someone like that. Yeah. I'm like obsessed with OJ because I didn't live it when it happened. So now that the FX thing is out, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like at night deep diving into <laughs> all of the evidence, trying to figure out, I just, I get it. I was like, oh my God. Um, that was a long tangent, but uh, yeah, let me stop. I don't know where I'm going with it. <laughs> well, I do think that that's an important Oh, but even within those yeah. spaces, right? Like respectable blackness, right? Oftentimes, Southern blackness is not seen as respectable blackness. Absolutely. Right? So like thinking about those layers of all of that to not be like, I'm a, just a black girl, but like I'm a Southern black girl. And like to, to root herself in that. And then also like that women have always been, black women have always been in formation when it comes to like fighting for all of our people, right? Yes. yes. And those nuances really come to the fore when you do look at race and gender together, which mm -hmm. sometimes people don't do, and just mm -hmm. talk about gender in a vacuum, which makes these assumptions about who are, what are the races of the gender people we're talking mm -hmm. about. And related to that, I wonder if you might say a bit about the words that people say that perpetuate unsafe environments for our folks, specifically for, um, queer and trans people of color? Like, how do you see the language that we use every day sort of uh, reframing or making assumptions about who people are? Well, I think like one of the, just maybe centering queer, um, queer and trans folk of color, just like the idea of like LGBTQ, right? Like just that as an acronym. Um, Oftentimes, there's a certain portrait of what we consider to be what LGBT is, right? When people hear that, it's become like its own brand of something, right? And the mainstreaming of that has oftentimes equated that to like white cisgender gay men, mm -hmm. right? And like their needs and what their priorities are. It doesn't necessarily think about, you know, the LGBTQ homeless youth, right, who are on the streets, right, who have nothing, who only have their bodies, who are engaged in sex trades, who are trying to survive, who are dealing with like nonprofit industrial complex and all of these things, right? Yes. Like we're not talking about them, right? And so for me, I often think about just like the labeling of that oftentimes is so reductive. Um, I'm glad that it may bring a whole diverse group of people together and make it seem as if there's like this one solid community and this one singular movement. But I know these, these, this um, acronym to be a lot more diverse and plentiful um, and its plur pluralities are not communicated often, right? Mm -hmm. Like the sense that like even within T, like I, I have said this so many times I am not a, an, um, an advocate or an activist for transgender people because I cannot, in this single body with this single experience, advocate for all transgender people because I don't know all transgender experiences. I am still learning, just from this, my own assumption the other night right. of that professor's gender identity and pronouns, right? Like, non-binary experiences are some things ref are reflective of my own, but they're not, right? Because even me, my own narrative is one that has often been held up as the kind of narrative we tell when it comes to um, transsexual bodies, right? Like this experience of medically and socially transitioning from one part of the binary to another part of the binary, right? Like, but there's folk who don't feel the need to do that. So I can't speak for all transgender people, right? And I've always centered trans women within my work but because things are taken out of my own control and my words and my labels are not even asked of me, like mm -hmm. when I do interviews, I'm then made the voice of. And we've seen how dangerous it yeah. is for folk to be seen as the voice of community, right? I work alongside my communities. I speak alongside my communities. Um, what was your question? That was great. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna leave it there. But like words and language, yeah. 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 Exactly. No, pronouns. I know your question was like about, not <laughs> pronouns, but like abuse of violent language that is often Right. Used. Well, I mean, related to pronouns, one of the things that's happening now is 
people are having a conversation about the use of cis versus the use of mm. non-trans and how and that's happening both within community mm -hmm. and outside making decisions about which language is preferred do you have any thoughts about what you what you would prefer people use um, I don't have my thing is if if we're consistently always labeling the thing that is seen as not normal or that deviates from the norm, I find that to be an issue. Yeah. Right? So like, you know, um, I was gonna equate race, but I hate, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not doing that today. Um, <laughs> thinking about the, just the sense of, you don't have to, I, I think I was, I forgot who I was speaking to about this, but you don't have to identify as cis. Do you know what I mean? Just like a trans person doesn't have to identify as trans. I know many trans women, once they've transitioned and are just living their lives, they don't identify as trans, they just identify as women. Right. right? But it doesn't take the fact away that a part of their experience is trans, right? Like that they see, but they, that may not be the way that they will then identify. So for cisgender people, it's like, you don't have to identify as cisgender, but cisgender is how we describe your experience that is not a trans experience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so for me, I, I, always find, I always struggle with the sense of, oh, this thing is different, so let's label that, and then this will be the normal. So this is the normal here, and everything else will then be labeled, right? That is definitely part of the problem, for sure. But then also thinking about, like, I remember my brother read the book, my book, and he was talking about, you know, he was just like, well, I'm a cisgender, black, you know, like just, and thinking about also how language can shut a lot of people out, too, mm -hmm. right? So like if people, like even now, like it's not a term, like cis is not a term that most people outside of academia or outside of like queer and trans circles and social spaces understand or know quite yet. Right. And so like, you know, if I'm having a conversation, if my grandmother was still alive and said like, you're a cisgender, and, she, and I, my grandmother's bold and she's, she's up front, so she'd be like, what is that, you know? But then some people would be like, they'll just nod, and then they'll just like shut off a conversation, because they're probably thinking in their mind, like, I don't know this word, so this must mean something about me that I don't know this word. Mm -hmm. And like, I think about that oftentimes, and so I think that's why within my memoir, I went to work at explaining words that a lot of folk, or thinking about like my 12-year-old self, didn't even, I didn't even use the word transgender. I didn't know that transgender was what I was. Right. Do you know what I mean? And so I always went back to that, like, how would I then, if I'm writing this book, not for the world, but for that 12-year-old trans girl who maybe doesn't even know what trans is yet, right. I need to then break everything down for her. And not so much, not so much teach her about how she should properly speak or the terms she should know, but more of this is the way that the world is talking about you. And speaking of your 12-year-old girl self, <laughs> Um, one of the things I really love is your incredible piece, The Free Girl Who is Everything in the Feminist Utopia. Mm. And uh, I have one more quote here. Um, in her world, the words girls and women do not need qualifiers. She will not furrow her brow, wondering if her interlocking identities are ingrained in its definition because of her foremothers, Sylvia and Audrey, Barbara and Marcia, she will no longer be burdened by the question Sojourner Truth had to ask, ain't I a woman? When she hears girls and women, Marissa Alexander, Gwyn Arujo, Renisha McBride, Cece McDonald, Island Nettles, Soradia Reyes, her sisters in Nigeria are all included. She will never doubt their inclusion or hers. And I thought that was such a beautiful vision and I'm wondering, how do we get there? What are the things that need to shift to help us create the world for this girl and the world for uh, your 12-year-old self? Well, I'm always challenged by that because I'm often invited into spaces where it's like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk about like the status of women and girls, right? And that I remember that piece coming out of a part of a speech that I gave um, at a foundation where. Um, one of the presidential candidates um, was giving the keynote, and it was all about, you know, making a statement around like the global status and condition of women and girls. And I always feel as if like trans women are rarely a part of that kind. Like we're not talking about trans girls, right? We're not talking about like a girl with a penis, right? Like we're not talking about 
a girl that is in transition. We're not talking about a girl that is. So like for me in my work, that's who I center, right? And so like I was, how do I bring her into this conversation, but also link her because I'm also a black trans woman. I'm also a black trans woman who engaged in the sex trades as a teenager to take care of myself in a world that wasn't taking care of me. Like how do I bring her as a part of a lineage of women as you know kitchen table women of color press barbara smith would say third world women right like right. so how do i bring her within that and um, not so much say that trans women are over here and all other women are there but to say that she's a part of even when we say girls and women these girls and women are not centered right, right. these girls and women when they're missing they're not on the covers of people magazine right um and so that's where that space came from how do we do that i think it's it's realizing that we have to take it beyond our own limited experiences and per perceptions mm -hmm. of what is deemed my experience, right? Like who, who goes away from that, right? Like who doesn't quite fit that experience for you? So like if you're saying girls, define what girls is to you, right? And then how then do we interrogate that and then to challenge that and then to open that up, right? And then how do we I always think of how do we bring the most oftentimes marginalized folk center, mm -hmm. right? Like Bell Hook said, the margins to center. How do we bring those folk in and then realize that by centering those most marginalized, those often silenced and invisibilized in many of our conversations and spaces and policies and all of those things, when we center them, we then become more liberated. Mm -hmm. I just, deep breath on that, yeah. Whew. Yes. How do we do that? How though? do you do? No, that's what I want to I ask you. Gonna... But like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think language is a big piece of that. Giving mm -hmm. people access to language that helps them see that there are other possibilities is a big piece. So, again, going back to your text, I think that the book gives people access to language they wouldn't have had access to before. Mm. I think that's one place that it moves. And in popular culture and media, that's another place where people get the opportunity to see a different reality. And I'm really encouraged by the things that people are creating for themselves. Mm. And that makes me think too about your hashtag girls like us, like creating spaces and using language to make space where there isn't any. Do you wanna talk about the origins of girls like us and how, you see, how you've seen it shift? I feel like I had like some random thought that came up that was really, really poignant, but I lost it. But with girl, <laughs> going on to Girls Like Us, just uh, in 2012, I, um, Twitter was a different thing in 2012. I joined Twitter in 2009. Um, and I remember just kind of wanting to have a space where I could talk about certain things and folk not necessarily knowing what I was talking about, but then folk that do know what that space is, they'll get it and know, right? And then they can engage. And so like, it was just for me when I hashtag girls like us, um, it was a space where trans girls could come together and trans women could come together and talk about their issues, their resources, share resources, share experiences, have a sounding board, link up. And what I've seen is that it's led to like real life friendships for people, even in my own space, like because I created that hashtag, I connected with people, right? I connected with other trans women who are now like friends of mine, like deep, deep, deep friends who I had never known before I created that hashtag. And I've seen that happen for other folk, right? So it was like a connector. Um, it's not something that I even have to like deal with, like I don't even use it as often as I used to because now it's like has its own world and it's a part of other people's lives. They put it in their Twitter bios instead of saying like, blatantly like I'm a trans woman, they just say hashtag girls like us. And it's something that, it's like a wink and a nod. Like it's yeah. like, yeah, the girls know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like that's kind of what it's, what it's become. I mean, I was really excited to see it in her story. Mm. It's like they use, <laughs> there's a moment where the two characters talk about girls like us. And, and like, that's like the power yeah. of like creating your own, creating the stories and the images and the words and the sounds that represent who you are, right? So like her story is a project that was created by Jen Richards, who is a trans woman, and starring Jen Richards and my other friend Angelica Ross, we met through hashtag girls like us. That's how we met. I was going to a speaking engagement in 2012 in Chicago, um, and I remember meeting them and I DM'd them through Twitter and was just like, let's 
get together. And so they became friends because of I linked them together. So it was like a great connector. That's a good process. You're a great connector because you also connected me to um, a friend here in Boston. You're good at that. And Twitter is a great space. I don't even for like people that much. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I like, I think because I do media work, it seems like I'm so like outgoing and social, but it's more like I would rather be at home like reading or binge watching something else. You know what I mean? Oh, what are you binge watching? Just I told you the OJ stuff. Yeah. Because I didn't live it the first time. It that the layer, it's just so layered. There's so much stuff there. Like the fact that, you know, I didn't really have a relationship to him, period, because I was too young. So I like when they were like OJ Simpson, you know, when I was watching the OJ Simpson FX series, I was like, why was he such a big deal? Like, I didn't know like, that having a Hertz commercial was a big deal, right? But <laughs> it was like, have a black man be a pitch, you know? Like, but seeing like, how he also then like, didn't really like, have black folk in his life beyond his family, right? Like, yeah. that he, had, he was one of those folks that believed, right? One of those public black people that believed that I can transcend race and I'm just like, the line in the series is like, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And I was, like, <laughs> I was captivated by that. And, and so like, then I just kind of wanted to see and like, what was going on and you know, the layers of domestic violence and how they believe that how they could pick the jury that black women were going to side with their, and the thing that they always do to black women is like, they're going to side with their gender over their race because, you know, he beat this woman. And then the next layer of like folks saying, well, Johnny Cochran knowing that, no, he, did, he married a white woman mm -hmm. and black women don't like that when our successful black, and so like all of these layers of like, and then also, again, people talking for black women with not necessarily like actually listening to what they would think about this. So anyway, so all those layers. And layers, <laughs> layers within layers mm -hmm. makes me think too about what are the words, <clears throat> what are the things that you're excited about now? How do you see people using words in fun new ways? Is there anything that's exciting you about the way that language and words are moving in this moment? Yeah, I think as we, so what excites me is the fact that we all now have access, right? Like our phones are like extensions of ourselves and they carry so much stuff on them, right? And so the fact that I'm constantly communicating with people on Snapchat, on Twitter, on Tumblr, I can follow a Tumblr tag and may not understand what it's talking about, but we'll be taught that day about someone else's experience. Um, I feel like because we have tools to create, we can now broadcast our lives, mm -hmm. right? We don't need to wait for a network or a producer to come and tell us, I wanna do a story on your life. No, I do a story on my life every day, mm -hmm. right? And so in that way, I no longer have to look at mainstream media to represent and reflect me. I can go to a hashtag and find more people, right, that reflect me. I can find my people, mm. you know what I mean? And then I can find myself. Right, and then I can be empowered because I found my people and myself to then share myself with the world, right? And so then we get more words and more definitions and some people may have a different definition for a certain word or an identity or an acronym, right? Like, or a letter, whatever it is. And so we get closer and closer to, I think, multi-layered truths that will be in contradiction and then in relationship to and, right? And so like even, I would even think about like, I would say like a year ago, or maybe when I even wrote Redefining Realness, I saw the gender binary as linear. Mm. And now I understand it more as like a kaleidoscope, right? It's all over the place, right? Male and female no longer get to, or man and woman or masculine and feminine no longer get to be like these ends, right? Bookends, they're no longer that. They're just a part of this wider collection, right? And no one is doing this anymore. No one's in the middle. right? You know what I mean? Like, I'm over here, she's over there, they're over here, Zay's over there. You know what I mean? Like, it, that's what it is. And people have to get comfortable with that because as we have these tools to broadcast our lives, there'll be more people, there'll be more voices, more definitions, more words. Mm. And, <laughs> but how do we get there? Like, how do, how do we get there? How do we get to the place where people are more comfortable with that kaleidoscope? I think the number one thing is we are all really, you know, I, I, my grandmother told me a long time ago when I was like, don't worry about what people think about you because they're just going to think about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like a couple seconds later, right? Right. And so the fear, <laughs> the fear in that, right? The fact that like someone over there identifies as such and such, that the way that they identify 
does not threaten the way that I identify. Right. It takes nothing away from me the fact that this person over there identifies as a non-binary, asexual, you know, crip dancer. Like, that is who they are. Right. That has nothing to do with me. And I think that people are uncomfortable because they're trying to make it about them. All you have to do is just understand that that's their identity, right? That's their pronouns. Them choosing their pronouns doesn't take away your use of pronouns. Yes, you have to adapt your language a bit when you speak with that person. But other than that, they're moving on with their lives. Like, it has nothing to do with you. It doesn't threaten your identity. It doesn't threaten your pronouns. It doesn't threaten your bathrooms. <laughs> And that's the piece that people keep coming up with, is that <clears throat> feeling of being threatened. I don't know if you've seen the, the prancing elites about... Love them. Love them. And I remember seeing an episode in which, and for those who don't know, prancing elites are a dance team, and they do a style of dance called J-setting, in, um, and they're based in Alabama. And one of, the, one of the episodes I saw was a man who was really uncomfortable with them dancing. And he <laughs> said... He's like, I don't like men wearing these kinds of clothes. Then don't it, wear those clothes. Like, that's my... Exactly. But that was his thing. He was like, it makes me uncomfortable. Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wonder, do you, do you want to say anything before we open it up to your... No. Question? Mm -mm. Okay. So um, if people have questions, and want to come to the front, I would ask that people actually ask questions, uh, not comments. And we'll take a couple of questions at a time, and then you can decide. Like, we'll maybe take two or three. We'll hear the question, and then you can, yeah? That sounds good. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things I've always loved about your work is that it it's always seemed to me as though, although you're talking about transgender and you're talking about sexuality and race, et cetera, in some ways it's really about people accepting who they are and accepting other people, allowing other people and accepting other people being who they are. Mm. And being, you know, that whole thing about being real, that it's, it's about accepting people and that's what's so thrilling about it is that, you know, the more we can have it, you know, a country and a world where people um, accept who they are and accept other people, beyond the issues of sex or race or whatever else, religion. Um, so I just wondered if you've thought about it in those terms of sort of mm -hmm. the broader issues of accepting other people just for who they are in any space and time and, and label. Yeah, sure. I um, thank you. Oh, Can I, I was answer. Well, I was gonna let one more person go, or do you want? I'm just gonna answer one by. It, okay. I'll forget. Okay. And then I'm gonna go off on the OJ tangent. Okay. <laughs> um, I. So for me, I think that the first time that I was confronted with the idea of of how my work was being seen was after the book went out. But I remember when I was being pre-interviewed for my interview with Oprah Winfrey. They were like talking about all these like universal themes of my book, like about everyone has a struggle with accepting themselves. And I was like, yeah, I guess. Like, you know what I mean? But like, that's not the way that I wrote it. Like, that wasn't what, I, and so I think that there's universal, universal themes that come out of someone just sharing their truth, right? And so like, I know in my own journey, it was incredibly difficult for me to even accept my own self. Mm. Um, and then to share that with, say, my siblings, my mother, my father, my best friend, um, and then going outside of that quote-unquote safe space and going into the world of school, community, volleyball team, you know, college, um, and thinking about how I wanted, I guess, a, maybe one of the unconscious intentions of writing the book was to make folk realize how hard it is to just accept your own truth and then to share it. And then also knowing that oftentimes sharing your truth can lead to exclusion and violence and harm mm -hmm. and all of those things, right? And so hopefully by breaking it down in the way that I did with my own experience, it enables us all to be a bit more open when someone comes to us with their own revelation, their own self-revelation, right? And feel safe enough to share it with mm -hmm. them. And I hope that that's what it does. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I'm glad that that's how you saw it. Thank you. 
And if you could say your name, too. Thanks. Uh, my name is Emma Kernan. I'm a first year at Brandeis University, and I know you'll be at our university in a few weeks, actually, so I'm looking oh, okay. forward to that. Um, as a first year, I've had the opportunity to be doing an internship with one of the scholars at the Women's Resource Center, and we're doing research around the use of language and the ways that you say it and the ways that you do it and how it can affect feminist activism. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Friedman is my scholar. Uh, and one of the questions that I've been trying to do research around is how forms of language, specifically the hashtag, how that can be used to create a form of activism. And I know as an activist yourself and an author uh, and generally very much involved in co uh, pop culture, how do you yourself find the use of the hashtag on Twitter and Tumblr useful for promoting activism? I think it's a great, um, again, a great connector for information. I know that oftentimes, you know, I'll go to, the first thing I wake up to is Twitter and the last thing I, I go to sleep to is Twitter. So like I'm always in on the conversation, but when I'm sleeping for my eight to 10 hours that I need mm -hmm. to look this way, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I wake up and something has gone off. I remember the other night it was like, I woke up to trap covers and I was like, what are trap covers? And then my entire life changed, right? And like, I don't know if that's... <laughs> so great. You have to watch the Adele one, it's so good. Um, the but Bohemian like, Rhapsody too. Really yeah, oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, um, and so for me, like, that, people may not see that as activism, but I think that people then wrote pieces, right, around this creation of this particular hashtag and talked about the layers of that, right? Like folk were, going back to Beyonce's formation, white people were singing acoustic versions of formation. <laughs> and then black people were like, okay, well then what we're gonna do is sing trap covers of your favorite classics and songs, right? And so like, it was this great conversation that was being had in this public space around race, around representation, around what we believe, what pop culture, um, creations are ours or yours or what are those lines um, and I think about like something like say her name which I know we didn't really get, we didn't get to talk about but say her name is one hashtag that um, you know now when a trans woman of color is murdered what often tends to happen is that uh, activist named Chernobyko now hashtags it because she's a part of the hashtag Black Lives Matter Network she then talks about the lives of black trans women oftentimes who have been murdered and she goes and does activism with their family. So she'll go to the funeral to make sure that they're not so much trained but to make sure that they use her pronouns and they don't dead name her and then they, you know, all of these layers that happen after these women are dead and so someone in the community through a hashtag was then empowered to go out and do work beyond just getting information, right? But then to also create like this system that's not even funded yet, but the system of resource and care to care for families of color who have trans daughters who don't even know how to deal with that intersection yet because oftentimes these girls were alone, right? In the world, they fled hostile homes, right? And so like there's now a black trans woman who goes out and does that work because of that hashtag. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Eleanor McCarty. I'm from McGill University in Canada. I study counseling psychology and I'm doing several research projects on trans this year. Um, one thing I'm recently looking at is media representations and obviously social media is a huge part of that nowadays. Uh, my question pulls on the themes of like passing versus failing, um, being an advocate for trans versus particular subgroups of the trans asterisk um, larger group. And I'm interested when we look at, um, I came across a YouTube video where it was a trans African American woman speaking about how she's now deciding to detransition and she felt that she had been tricked by women, um, trans women in the media and mm -hmm. trans women celebrities mm -hmm. who were appearing like goddesses and who mm -hmm. were passing mm -hmm. and who um, had more positive experiences than this woman who felt really uh, continuously rejected by society, had you know, s sold her body and um, 
was still not passing and still felt rejected and mm -hmm. basically was saying that she had been tricked. So my question coming full circle is, as you said, um, passing is a privilege and being attractive and beautiful is a privilege and having a voice for that uh, is a privilege. For the people who don't have that privilege, who don't pass or mm -hmm. who um, face lots of hardships in their lives, how can we, or how, this is kind of an impossible question maybe, but how can they advocate for themselves without that privilege? Or how can we shape a society that can have more of a frame for less privileged people, let's say people who don't pass, to have their own voice and not just look to people who are passing? I think that that's an incredibly convoluted question. It's layered in so many ways. There's so many, just in the framing of it, is problematic. What it broadcasts to this entire room, I think, is problematic, too. Um, it's difficult for me to then break all of the layers of that down. But um, I think that all women are girl and girls, not just trans women, are faced with impossible images in media. Mm. So let's not just say trans women are grappling with that, right? Um, who, are, who are harming themselves because of what the media has created as the image. Um, so trans women are not only grappling with the idea of wanting to, um, some trans women, we also have to be clear, because not all trans women's goal is to pass. I think that there, we are cognizant that the system privileges folks that do pass and blend in, um, but I don't think that there's a goal for all trans women. Um, I feel incredibly deeply sad for that this um, woman felt that way and that that was her journey, but that is her journey. I don't quite know it. Um, um, in terms of folk in media and what the media representation is, I, I think it's deeply flawed. Um, I don't believe, again, that all trans women who are in media pass. Um, I think a lot of them would say that they don't. I do believe that a lot do subscribe and are allowed into the room because there's a certain layer of what I would say is acceptable femininity, um, a femininity that is often celebrated, right? You can think about size. You can think about the ways in which um, grooming is a part of it. Um, now, do I believe that these women are doing this in order to cater to? That, I don't believe that is a part of that. I believe that they're showing up as themselves and they're groomed in the way that they believe that they want to present to the world and that is then privileged and allowed in, right? Um, but in terms of how do we, you know, how do we create a world? Um, you know, how do we create a world where, right now what we're grappling with in the movement, I think, is daily access issues for folk, right? Like, how do you even, how are you resourced, right? And, you know, one of the great um, ironies to me is that trans women of color specifically embody many different identities, but rarely does all those identities and those communities show up for them, mm -hmm. right? So we have feminist movements that are dealing with gender, right? We have LGBT movements, which are supposedly supposed to be tasked with dealing with trans issues. And we have racial justice movements, oftentimes, that are not centered around bodies that are not cisgender black males, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so these, there's no coalition work in between, because everyone says, well, that's the LGBT work that's supposed to deal with these trans people, right? But even with the LGBT stuff, oftentimes, the dominant narrative is white gay cisgender men. So. Um, that's the great tragedy, I believe, in the existence for trans women of color. And I think that this particular woman, if I'm just, you know, just based on what I, the sound bites that I just heard, um, was dealing with a lot of trauma every single day, daily access trauma to even leave their home, right? And so I think people don't even understand what it takes for people who are grappling with um, living their truth to just leave their home if they have a home. Right? Um, and so all of that stuff, yeah. Thank you. Hello, my name's Beckett. I am a sophomore at Harvard. And your definition of realness sounds like it could be incredibly empowering and give you some 
strength to help get through all of the daily um, like s barriers that come up if you aren't a cis person, if you aren't a white person. Um, my question is, what if you struggle with identifying who you are to yourself? Mm. Um, because if realness is who you are to yourself, how can you be real for yourself if you aren't really sure who you are? Um, how do you yeah. address that? <laughs> well, I think that for me, that was one of the, my earliest dissonances, right? Was like the idea of the first things I learned from my parents was that I was a black child in America, a poor black child in America, grappling with that. And then the idea of, and you're also a boy child in America, and this is who you are, right? So like getting these definitions and labels from parents, and then the work for me came in, and a lot of the confusion and heartache and trauma and policing that I dealt with was trying to be in that space of not knowing and not being certain. I think one of the first things I read about in the book is around uncertainty and embracing that as a young person. Um, it was hard to do that. I can now, the person that was 25 to 27 who wrote that could understand that, <laughs> but then for the you know, four to 12 year old person, it was incredibly difficult and I didn't have the words then and I didn't have the definitions then and that's a part of the self-discovery process. And for, for me, it happened quite young that I was able to face those things um, and find the people that I needed to find and find my community who helped me figure out what that was for me, right? What my identity was and who I was and the resources that I would need to find to be able to be who I am. Um, and some people, it happens later on and it's a longer process and there's things that are in the way and obligations that come in and family abuses and all of those things. And so I think that this is part of the self-discovery process. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so. Hi there. Uh, my name is John Kelly. I'm a first year grad student in religion and trans theory here at Harvard. Um, something that I really love uh, is your friendship with Laverne Cox and the way that you talk about your friend Wendy. And so I was wondering if you could talk about what it means to be a trans person or just a human person doing this work in relation to others and the importance of sort of friendships and relationships uh, in being able to sustain the work and inspire you? Um, I don't think I'd be able to do this work without my chosen community and chosen family. Um, Wendy was, you know, someone I met at 12 years old and I don't really know my what my life would be without her. So for me, it's just, an integral part of my, you know, my existence. I don't know what it would be if I, the thing that I will say about true community is that I can show up empty and nothing is expected of me. Um, and I think that's the, you know, that's, I think that's the goal. You know, I take um, and I grapple with a lot in places that are not my home. I'm taking out of my home and brought to spaces like this to speak and talk and grapple with questions from folk. And I love being in community, I mean, being in conversation with people. Um, but it's, takes a, it's a toll, it's work. Uh, and um, I get to then go home and, you know, text or call, um, shadily Snapchat <laughs> with, <laughs> you know, people that I love and care about and check in. And so I think that because they also do, well, Wendy doesn't. Wendy's a makeup artist and, you know, she's in, I think she's in like Paris right now for Paris Fashion Week doing, and you need to watch her, her Instagram is so funny. Please go on her Instagram. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I check in with Laverne from time to time and, you know, she has as grueling of a schedule. And I think w the difficult part, I think what really bonds us and connects us to the idea of being public private people mm -hmm. um, and engaging with media and having stories and words and things shaped around and then people believing that that is who you are um, or the facets of you are shown in one place but it's not really the totality of who you are. And so for me it's like being able, my goal is oftentimes being able to show up empty and then also to show up fully mm. as who I am. Um, and so yet there's just, I think that we can't do this work without having um, 
true community. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emma Staffaroni. I'm a high school teacher uh, and also a compulsive MSNBC watcher. Um, although I feel that I've had- Still? <laughs> still, yeah. yeah. So this is my question is sort of, I like many of us in the room, I'm sure <coughs> have had crisis of faith with mainstream media and I appreciated mm. your points about the way social media are disrupting um, that. But I would just love to hear a little more from you about like, your relationship to mainstream media mm. now that you have carved out this space on MSNBC um, with So Popular and sort of, uh, I feel like created a space to be critical of the, the rest of the media uh, around you, even on that same channel, uh, especially in light of recent news this week mm. um, with uh, Dr. Melissa Harris Perry. So I guess I just am interested in hearing from you about that. Well, it was so funny is that I've always, my entire life, I've engaged, you know, I never worked, I don't think I've ever worked in independent media beyond like social media, but even that's like, attached to a whole nother corporation. But uh, I'm thinking about, you know, from when I was at People Magazine, which was, you know, the number one magazine in America, it's what people read every week and it has lives and, you know, nail salons to doctor's offices and it just sits there, right? Um, and, um, it's difficult to, the difficult part is being an employee within and still having a public voice to critique. That's a line that um, specifically has been difficult this past week um, in light of uh, Melissa Harris Perry's show not existing anymore. I'm incredibly inspired by um, her resistance, um, her resistance to say this is not the space that we, I created with my producers and I no longer want to engage in this space anymore, so I'm going to get out of this contract. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but she also has Wake Forest to go back home to, you know what I mean? So I think a lot of people don't have that same set of like, I have a whole nother career, like TV was fun for me to do, but I'm done with that. Um, for me, I don't think that, I don't think I would ever be in a space where I feel as I would have to be silent about um, gaps that I notice. Um, and I think that when I, you know, when I created and pitched and hosted um, So Popular, that it was always my space and my space there was to fill in gaps. Um, I don't think that that show is prioritized um, at the network anymore, and I don't see myself being at the network for much longer. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Tracy Abbott. I'm a professor of English and Media Studies and Gender Studies program at Bentley University. So I'm curious about how you feel about, we've been talking about affixing prefixes to identities and communities and how you feel about it being affixed to movements because as someone who's worked um, with gender, queer, and transgender representations for a long time, a recent mm. collection came out about trans feminisms by Anne Anki and it was very helpful for me personally mm. because it bridged this divide between queer studies and feminist studies, mm -hmm. but at the same time, and it, it of course engaged in the conversations about feminisms, but at the same time calling it trans feminism somehow also makes it seem distinct from feminism, which to me is about gender equality for all genders, mm. not just two genders or people a gender. And so I'm curious about how you see prefixes like that when they're fixed to uh, movements or, or disciplines as being useful because they're infusing a perspective into the traditional definition that makes it broader, but at the same time maintaining a binary between, you know, say trans feminism and feminism as if it's a false binary, like they're not mm. the same thing. Uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to have, um, to be exacting in our language about what our work is and what it centers. So I would assume in trans feminism, the work centers trans folk within the fight for gender equity. Um, I think that if we think about the definition of where feminines, who created and what feminism is, it often didn't include like women of color, for example, or poor women, right? And so then it took a lot of poor women, specifically I think about black women, right. um, like Barbara Smith to say like, well, we're gonna have black feminism, right? And so I think that it's okay to have those separate spaces that are part of this larger umbrella of what the original 
shifting, I guess, kind of term is. It's, I'm not, I guess I'm not bothered by people creating um, their own within. Well, what I'm, what I'm hoping, though, too, is that it, it does undermine the concept of, say, feminism being only for certain kinds of women, certain kinds mm. of privileged women in particular. Mm -hmm. But it does. A right. part of it does, though. Right. Like, that's the reality. And so I think that, that it would probably was created in reaction to being in probably such a space that was just seen as feminism that didn't want these people a part of it. And so the radical revolutionary resistant thing is then to go and say that we are a still a part of this and we will still fight for your liberation, but because you're not fighting for ours, we need to create a space where our liberation is centered, right? And so I think that that's what it probably came from because if feminism was for really for everybody, then we, would, we wouldn't have these other right, right. spaces. Thank you. Um, we'll take these two more questions. Oh, together. Together, yeah. Okay. So ask your question and then we'll hear the last. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there's three. Yeah. There, the, there's Just two. Okay. Oh, okay. No. Um, oh, okay. Uh, my name's Alicia Abbott. I'm a, an author and a journalist writing on LGBTQ issues. And I was just wanting to sort of return to the topic of uh, violence against trans people, especially trans women, especially trans women of color, often at the hands of um, straight-identified straight cis men. And I was sort of wondering if, you know, what, if, if there needs to be more visibility f and support for straight-identified cis men who are attracted to trans women, that they can be open about those relationships, or, you know, so much, if there's stigma that provokes violence because of rigid, you know, definitions of straight male mm -hmm. sexuality, what's at play? So I just was hoping you might be able to comment on that. Um, so, uh, my name is Kat Macias. Um, I pass in a number of ways, some pass actively, some passively. Um, and in hearing you talk about um, passing with regard to race, class, and gender, um, I, 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 I felt compelled to like make a link to assimilation. And I'm wondering if you can talk at all to that link, because um, I feel like there are things that are left behind in both situations. Um, so I wanted to see here your thoughts on that. I feel like I spoke a little bit about assimilation in the sense of talking about shedding certain things from my own community, the way in which, you know, speaking Hawaiian pigeon or speak, choosing to speak in a certain way that presents a more, in a better class space in order to like pull myself up in the bootstraps as they, the Republicans would say. <laughs> um, so I feel like I've kind of, I feel like I've touched on that um, in terms of, the men who date trans women or have sex with trans women. I've written about this and I struggle oftentimes because folk are like, well, don't you think you should create space for these men to like gather and talk? And I'm like, no, I don't believe that I should create. I think that they need to deal with their stuff, right? Like, and I do know the danger of also like, yes, there needs to be a space where, you know, um, men who date and have sex with or and or fetishize trans women can come together and get each other and deal with that and have conversations. And I believe that recently there was a protest at the Creating Change conference in Chicago where trans women of young trans women of color shut down such a panel that was created for um, these men. Um, because one of the men were, was an alleged abuser of mm. trans women and blah, blah, blah. So all that stuff. So like domestic partner violence, intimate partner violence is real and that oftentimes is a part of the, um, a part of the harm that happens to trans women. Also knowing that um, because they don't have, because those men have not created those spaces for themselves um, and probably don't feel as if they need to create that space for themselves, they are then taking out that frustration that they're getting from being policed by their masculinity and their sexuality onto that mm -hmm. woman that they are in a relationship with, right, who's already grappling with her own stuff. Um, and so I feel like that's the cycle of that. So I do think that if there is someone out there who is, I do think that that's a vacuum or a space that, that needs to be filled. But not by you. It's just yeah. not work that I'm committed yeah. to doing, but I understand the need for it. Yeah, I just wonder if it's complicated because, you know, you wouldn't want to just 
maybe they're dating a woman who doesn't want to disclose her trans status, so in some ways. But I understand. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that, um, that you know, there's not a lot of visibility for straight identified men who are in relationships and healthy relationships with uh, trans women and that they may experience stigmas because they feel like they're the only one. And so um, yet for maybe someone to come out and say, I'm dating a trans woman, I'm with a trans woman, that would be disclosing, you know, like trying to justify, you know, disclose the status of their partner that which would be violating that person's privacy. And I'm just sort of wondering about the importance of visibility to reduce the stigma that might be experienced by straight identified uh, transamorous men. Um, so I feel like transamorous is one thing. So I, my husband is such a man that, you know, but he's not a public person, but he is someone that he's, you know, in the intimate part of our relationship has allowed me to write about our relationship and our experience has allowed me to let a magazine come and photograph our wedding and to put in, you know, like these things, these images, I believe, exist. Um, I do think that, you know, um, there are other s spaces, instead of having to be public, to then grapple with those issues, right? Whether that's with a social worker or a therapist, that's a private space where you're not necessarily disclosing um, your partner's transness. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's thank Janet Moyle. Thank you.